Stelito, welcome to my podcast. <laughs> Welcome to your spare room. <laughs> well, it's a very small room as well. I had um, Richie over here uh, before I had the camera set up, and I said, welcome to my studio. And he goes, wow, it's a very small studio, isn't it? Oh, there you go. But are these not real bricks? No, that's wall... Oh, oh. I've ruined the illusion. Oh, shit. No, it's wallpaper. No, it's, it's coming along good. Hey, thanks so much, mate. You're um, you're uh, like a dream guest. So, that, that's, that's seeing your name in lights, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. That's good, I like that. Yeah, well, I mean, um, yeah, there's no TV person that's ever offered me any sort of work, so no. <laughs> <laughs> buy a couple of cameras now, get your own neon exactly. sign, boom, that's the way. you're in business. Um, so how are you? How are you today? Um, I'm good. I, um, I got back, um, so I've been away overseas for about four years, three and a half, four years, and then um, did the World Cup, and then came back first of November I think so so yeah it's been it's been nice being back in New Zealand actually I've really enjoyed it yeah we'll, we'll get to the um the World Cup uh later on in your involvement in that but um yeah while I was doing my notes yesterday it's like oh you, you've been um at two World Cup finals <laughs> yeah, I've, well I've, yeah I've, um, maybe you're a bad luck charm <laughs> yeah no I've been to the only World Cup I haven't been to was the J- Japanese one right um no but I mean in, in terms of official involvement you were 95 oh, yeah, and 95 yeah that was my fault and uh, <laughs> must yeah yeah it must have been my fault this last one as well. Oh yeah, you're 95. That was the food poisoning one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Susie the waitress. Yeah. Okay, so um yeah, so you've been in New York the last four years, um working with um rugby over there, yep. um and and you moved from New York to Tyro and Tyro like the the land mass of that place is probably like half of Central Park. So there is um less people live in Tyro than live in my apartment block in New York. <laughs> so um yeah it was quite a shock but um but i loved it i loved being in Tyra and uh people are amazing and um you know if you told an american if you if you if you took Tyra and designed it and said to an american this is where you could live they'd think it was paradise mm. so we take that stuff for granted a bit and yeah. um i mean it is it's like paradise it's just it's just an incredible place. Mm. I, I went all the way back through your Instagram page, and you, you do share a lot, which is really cool. Um, back to as, as far as it goes back. What, why? And it seems like Tyra is a special place for you. Always has been. Yeah. Why is that? Um, oh, when my son was young, um, we'd take him to Tyra, and then uh, you know we we bought a place down there, and it's just um, yeah, it is. It's it's, and I, I realised a few years ago that I, you know I got a lovely place down there, and I needed to spend more time down there. Um, uh, you know what's what? What's the use of building something beautiful and, and not and not using it? Mm. And so um, yeah, I love it down there, and I um, just so much. It's just the simplicity of it is what I like, and um, and in the space mm. um, and the sea. You know, one of the things that I struggle with a bit being in New York for sort of so long was um, you just don't see the ocean. I mean, yeah. we could see the the, the Hudson River, but not, you know, <laughs> not the same bodies floating <laughs> past and stuff like that. But it's, yeah, it's a little bit different. Yeah. So you're um, we're we're recording this uh, two days before you're going in for a knee replacement operation. Yep. So how old are you? Sixty one. Uh, twenty eight. Twenty eight. Yeah, twenty eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, um, aging. It's a barrel of laughs, isn't it? Oh, yeah. We were chatting about this just before. Like, I'm, I'm a, I'm a runner. I've got knee issues. I have a big run, and then I'm fucked for a couple of days afterwards. Yeah. Well, I've, I've done pretty well because I don't do anything. So, um, you know, uh, I managed to sort of. I mean, considering I injured the knee in what was it, 1982 or something, and now <laughs> I'm finally getting operated on now. So it's, it's been not a bad run, but um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it because, uh, you know, I mean, I like, I'm still pretty active, I still like to do stuff, you know, um, and like surf and various things, so I can't wait to get back and um, getting strong again. Yeah. Um, I no re- running, though. No, no, you've never been a runner? No. <laughs> I did at school, I, I remember I started off, um, I started off in an athletics club doing the 1500 metres. And then I went to the 800, 400, down to the 2 and 1, and then, then I'd become a high jumper because I worked out that the high <laughs> jump was the least amount of effort required. Like so, eight paces or something. Yeah, and you just sit down in the sun, like, and then, oh, you're up, oh, yeah, no, nah, pass. And then you'd, do, you know, you'd probably do four jumps, you know. Oh, it's just a great event. I loved it. 
Unreal. Um, I read on your LinkedIn page, um, and I, I really love this. I thought this is quite profound. Uh, this is your most recent post. Yeah. Uh, what's next? Uh, two of the most exciting words in the English language, especially when you are completely open to where you might end up. Yeah, what is next? I mean, you, you, you're 61, but um, I, yeah, I feel like you've still got... I, don't know, I saw a, th- a thing online yesterday. It said at the age of 60, you've got like um, probably at least 1,000 good weeks left. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if that's a grim way of looking at it or yeah. a positive way of looking yeah. at it. Um, I think um, I just decided to not push it and um, just chill and see what comes my way, you know, and um, had some really interesting conversations since I've been back with all sorts of projects. And, um, you know, some people just want some help, and uh, which is great. I love doing that. And I think... Um, I, I, I don't know what next, um, but I'm not worried by that. I, I, I know there will be in what next. Um, but it's quite it's quite nice to just take a bit of time and and just work on yourself a bit, you know, instead of working for someone else. So I've been enjoying that. Um, I've been enjoying uh, looking at my laptop and finding some of the things that I wrote that I never finished, um, whether they're program proposals or scripts or whatever um it's been really cool to sort of just have time to finish them um because you know when you're looking at your your documents folder or whatever and you see all these things and you're like oh, i never should have i should have done that i didn't finish that you know it's nice to just get them sorted you know so i've been enjoying that and i've been enjoying pizza <laughs> is there a good pizza place in there's Tyro? a pizza truck in Tyro it's <laughs> awesome yeah oh god yeah. hey um, well, it's been it's been um, uh, such a vast um, varied and, and successful career we'll, we'll, we'll go through all that it's like a greatest hits but let's go all the way back so um, yeah memories from growing up where did you grow up where did the sense of humour come from so I grew up um, in South Auckland um, well early, early days in Green Lane but then I um, my college was at De La Salle College in, in Mangere or Mangry when I grew up, but it's obviously different now. Um, oh, that's with with JK. You you guys were schoolmates. Well, yeah, John Kerwin. I was there first, and he followed. <laughs> um, and yeah, and so went to De La Salle College, which um, uh, I think my time there best described as high spirited. Um, <laughs> well, I got through it, and uh, yeah, I met JK um, uh, in the first team. We're in the first team together. Uh, I was the number eight, and he was the halfback. And he just got bigger and bigger as the season got on, um, and then uh, and then yeah, and I love I love my time. I love I love South Auckland. It's so vibrant. And what I really like about it now is um, you know obviously it was always so when I moved there, it's a big freezing worker sort of population, and lots of people worked at Otahu Freezing Works, Otahu Freezing Works, um, you know South Down and stuff like that. And then um, and then the Polynesian population really sort of um, um, really took off and what I like now is the pride in the Polynesian heritage and culture that I see out there yeah. which probably wasn't there when I grew up so much um, I love that I think it's awesome and um, you know even my school you know as I got through the later years it was getting stronger and stronger Polynesian now it's probably 99% Polynesian and it's just such a vibrant uh, amazing community it's brilliant and oh, and you went to, I read this, I don't know if it's true or not, you went to primary school with uh, JK, John Key? Oh, no, well, I, I'm not sure. We, we had a chat about it. So <laughs> he, I went to Cornwall Park Primary, and apparently so did he, and we worked out that we were about the same age, and he, but he, I think we crossed over like six months, and when you're five, you don't tend to remember people, mm. but... Um, and, yeah, unless it's your, like your best friend yeah, that you yeah, sort of yeah, grew up yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, I don't remember him having right. a big impact at the time. Yeah, and what about um? Yeah, what about your sense of humour? Because you've got this sort of um, relentless self-deprecation. Does that does that come from your mum, your dad, grandparents? Where's that? The, well, dad's Italian, so a chef, um, right? Chef, yeah. Um, so uh, his, his 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 he was a very funny man, but his sense of humour was um, uh, different. And um, and mum, yeah, good Kiwi, and uh, you know, again. Just a normal family, just a fantastic family. But I think, um, I mean, I was just lucky, I think, growing up, you know, I mean, probably the biggest influence for me was watching John Clark, Fred Dick. Mm. I just yeah. used to love him, watching him and listening to him on the radio and 
buying his records and stuff like that. Um, what I loved about it was, uh, you know, incredibly talented, but but never the self-deprecating thing I liked because it was he never made out that he was the smartest guy in the room, um, but he was. But he didn't need to tell everyone, and um, yeah, he was he was a massive influence on me. I, I, everyone in my generation, you know, he was he, he was it. We, we had one comedian, and it was him. And he was everywhere. Yeah. That must have been nice for you um, going full circle when you were in Sports Cafe and you got to do a version of um, We Don't Know How Lucky We Are. What a hat tip. I think um, that was probably the, of all the things I've done, that's probably one of the things I'm most proud of is that uh, I, I, one day, I, I must have been watching the Olympics or something, something was annoying me about the <laughs> um, national anthem was just a bit boring, you know? And I was like, we need a new national anthem. It should be, you know, we don't know how lucky you are. we are. And I listened to the record and it wasn't quite right. It wasn't as I had imagined it. It was a, 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 a like a poem over a guitar strum. And so I rang John Clark. I'd never met him before in my life. I had, you know, he had no idea who I was. And I said, look, mate, I'm um, Rick Sweet, so I, I do a TV show in New Zealand. You've never heard of it. Um, but... I'd love to bring We Don't Know How Lucky We Are to life as a national anthem. And he's like, I like the idea. I don't know who you are. Send me a copy of your show. And if I like it, I'll ring you back. So, <laughs> what episode do you send yeah, Jesus. So sent, a lot yeah. of thought goes into that one. All right. <laughs> I think I just sent him the one from the previous week. And, um, and he rang me back, which was cool. And so um, we'd asked Neil Finn if he'd help, and Eddie Rayner, if they'd work with Graham Hill on the music, which they did. And then... I sort of said to John, I said, mate, I need you to write a new verse at the beginning and at the end to make it a bit more of an anthem. And he's like, cool, I'll give you a call. So he gave me a call about a week later, he's, here they are. And I was like, mm, they're not quite right. And I remember thinking to myself, how am I going to tell John Clark that it's not quite what I'm looking for? Cause, and, and he was so mean. I said, look, mate, we just need to tweak this. Because we're trying to do an anthem, and anthems are more like this. And and he's like, "Get it straight away. You're right." Bang. The next day, you know, came back and gave us the finished version. And um, and then and then I just sat back and let them go, you know. Mm. And uh, I mean, yeah, he is. I mean, it was funny with things I was doing over this over the Christmas break as I was watching John Clark stuff on um, on YouTube, watching the old uh, documentaries on him when he passed away. Um, and just a, a, a absolute genius, mm. like like clever, you know. Um, and I remember he was saying to me, "You do know the song's ironic." <laughs> I know, <laughs> I know. That's what makes it funny. <laughs> but it's, it's um, great. It, it is great. That makes you. I, I don't know. It gives me yeah. goosebumps hearing that song. Yeah, it's yeah, bloody great. Yeah. Makes you makes you happy yeah. to be a Kiwi. Yeah. So um, so, yeah, so, so why journalism? So when you left school, you became like a like a journalist. Did, yeah. You, yeah, how did... I, I applied for everything. You're obviously quite um, a good footy player, right? Like you're in the first no, 50... No, I was, no I, was, I was good enough, but I, um, I, what I did was I applied for everything. <laughs> I applied to teachers, college. Um, uh, I, I, I hadn't spent a lot of time at school in my last year. <laughs> um, so um, I... And I applied to journalism school not really knowing what it was, and I got in... And I was like, sweet, I'll go to that then. Because I knew it was really hard to get into. But in those days, it was a six-month course. And um, you had, um, I think, 400 applicants for 30 places, something like that. And I knew it was hard to get in. So if I thought if I got in, then I need to go. And um, and I'll work out what journalism is when I get there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and, and, and that's why I showed up. Um, and I... Got in trouble my first week. I um, I'm trying to remember what I did. I, I got um, <laughs> I, I threw something at a cricket game and ended up being locked up. And um, locked up, locked up, yeah. locked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, oh, like a like a central districts game or something. And you threw. No, no, it was a, it was New Zealand India test match. And oh, um, oh, fuck, I knocked the hat off the policeman. They used to have those big tall hats. <laughs> yeah, the big pointy ones. And um, I. Uh, yeah, please, kids do not do that at home. That's terrible behaviour. And I, um, so the next week I had to go to court and, and I decided I was going <laughs> to defend myself. And I stood up in the dock and looked into the gallery and there's my um, 
class doing court reporting that day and I'd called in sick so it wasn't a great start um, and then I did my I did my um, remember they asked the plea and I went not guilty and the police prosecutor laughed <laughs> it's like a, you're on a do you mind if we take him out the back and show him the summary of facts and, and I went oh that's not good is it that doesn't look good <laughs> like I could get the electric chair on these summary of facts so um so the, the detective inspector who caught me said, oh, look, we, I said, I can't, I can't have a conviction. I need to, I'm going to be a journalist. I'm going to be a sports journalist. And they're like, okay, well, let's, let's write a speech, you know, and let's apply for um, discharge without a conviction under Section 42 of the Justice, Criminal Justice Act. So we wrote this beautiful speech. And so I went back in the dock and I just gave this beautiful piece of poetry. And the judge said, I'm a big cricket fan and it's because of people like you, you spoil the game, but people like me, bang, gave me the, <laughs> the maximum fine, gave me everything. And I looked at the I looked at the policeman, I was like, he's like, oh, fuck, we tried, you know. <laughs> so so it wasn't a great start to my journalism career. Um, it didn't hold you back though, ultimately. No, but I um, I didn't um, I didn't get a certificate, I got a blank piece of cardboard and um, just to make me feel better. And yeah, and and then I got in the radio, and and I think, I and I think a lot of kids probably go through this. I think I'd just been at school too long, mm. and um, I knew. I mean, thank God I didn't go to university. Um, I knew that um, that once I got to the workforce, you know, I'd be sweet, and so I I end up at Radio Pacific, which back then was out in Manukau, and um, oh was, yeah, with Derek Lowe. Yeah, Derek yeah, Lowe, Gordon yeah. Dryden. Um, and uh, yeah, Brent Impey, funnily enough, was the sports announcer. Um, so yeah, that's where I started. Well, see, he was he was a lawyer when I first got into radio. He, in no, like before that, he was a before that he, he was a lawyer, but right. he used to do the Saturday sports um, show on Radio Pacific. So oh, right. that's when I met him. Yeah. Well, and then so you ended up in um, Tauranga at One Double X. Yeah, um, was that was that a was that a big spec? Then it was like either government owned, like the RNZ stations, or yeah. privately owned. Was that a privately owned one? Yeah, so so I always worked for the private stations. So there was a real rivalry between mm. Radio New Zealand and the private stations. And so, I, you know, you, you'd move around because that was how you got up the journalism ladder. You know, because we used to have grades. You know, so J one, J two, J three. Every time you moved, you got up a grade. So I went uh, Pacific, Fakatane, Avon and Christchurch, Windy and Wellington. And I was at uh, Haraki in uh, Auckland with um, Kevin Black and John Hooksby and Phil Gifford and all those guys. Oh, so, my God. Yeah, it was great times. That was an incredible station, an yeah, incredible yeah. show too. Yeah, yeah. So it was um, – and I loved I loved radio. I loved, I loved working in private radio. Every, every radio station had its own news team, about six, seven people. And it was just, just a golden age. It was mm. brilliant. And some incredible broadcasters, mm. amazing, and some some incredible characters too. Like when yeah. I started in nineteen ninety, like the um, the guy that was my program director, Vaughan. Like I remember McDonald's had a, a like a sale, and it was like ninety nine cent hamburgers. So he went down there with like a food town bag, bought fifty of them, and put them in his freezer. Yeah, just characters like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no rules. Mm. And I mean, then and then so then you end up on on uh, on TV, right? As, so and, I went to London. I went to um, I went to because <laughs> I. I couldn't afford to go to Europe, so um, I rang up Andy Hayden and said, can you get me a contract? Um, and he's like, who's this? And um, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm Rick. And he, so he said, look, I, I'll, I'll, I'll jack you up a club in Italy, but you'll have to be on trial. Go over there, and, and, and if, they, if they like you, they'll sign you, you know, and they'll sort you out. So Because rugby was an amateur game back then. Mm. And um, so I went over, um, played the game, they signed me and then they gave me a house and a car, to, you know, and, and and so I was there for a little while and then at the end of that I went over to London and did a couple of years working in radio there and I remember when I was, the, the Aussie stations that we were, I was a foreign correspondent for, rang, rang my boss and they said, mate, we can't have that, um, can't have that wog name uh, from London. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to have to change his bloody name. It's like so. The boss came in and he said, "Sorry, you can't be Rick Salizzo anymore." So I was Richard Holmes, Richard Holmes, London, and um, <laughs> and I was on the radio stations here as Richard Holmes, London. And my mum rang the radio stations, going, "That's not Richard Holmes. That's my son. I know, I know that voice anyway." 
But yeah, I, so I was Richard Holmes. And the, so how did you end up on TV? Because when you were on TV news here, was was there only TV One News, or was there TV Three, or was this pre TV? No, pre TV Three. So I came back from London with Kathy. We both came back, and back then, if you worked in London, everyone thought that was incredible. <laughs> so, so I went went, went away as a pain in the ass and no one wanted and came back from London and everyone was like, oh, do you want a job? And um, so I was hired to fill in for Jane Dent uh, in the sports team and and Kathy came and she worked in the newsroom as a health reporter. So we were both hired um, because we came back from London. Oh, so, yeah, so Kathy Campbell, um, yeah. your your wife, we can talk about her later on if you want, but um, yeah, so you, you met in journalism school and you were... You were you no, we met at Radio up... I. We met at Radio oh, I. Right. We, we worked in radio together and then... You partnered up straight away. Yeah, and she wanted to go... She was going to Europe and I wanted to follow her and I couldn't afford it, so right. that's why we went and played rugby. Right. But the... um. Like, like the when you were on like TV sports news, it was like a golden age for for news. I mean, you look at some of the names like Hawksby, Long, yeah. Sherry, Bradley, Bailey, Deordney. Like, um, yeah. <laughs> did you, ha, ha, like, I mean, how? So I had to read the. Um, I started as a reporter, and um, I was the first first time the news um, team had assigned a reporter to the All Blacks because that, before that, before I came along, they were it was always like. Graham Thorne or whatever, they'd be away on tour and they'd like chuck a microphone. And, but the 87 World Cup was coming and they were like, you know, we need someone to travel with the All Blacks. And so that was me, which was pretty cool, you know. And um, and then one day I'd been doing some practice news reading with Richard Long and he just, and this would never happen now, he's like, rang me up and he said, what are you doing? It was a Sunday afternoon. I said, nothing. He said, come on, you're going to read the news tonight. Didn't, didn't tell anyone, you know, <laughs> so... So I ran, I think I was with Tom Bradley my first night, and um, so I read the news, the sports news, and then I did it again the week after with Angela, do you know And I got this review, so I got a call on, like, must have been the Monday, Tuesday morning from Richard Long going, don't read the Herald. So what do you mean? <laughs> don't read it, come to work, I'll talk to you. So first thing I did was go to the gates and oh, of course. steal someone else's Herald, <laughs> take it back. And my review was, um, and I remember it's burned in my memory. It was like, who is this guy? Rick, Rick Salizzo has a face like a reed rubber tire. Um, it's not <laughs> so much when he should get off screen. It's how he ever got there in the first place is the question. I was like, that's oh, savage. Man, that's harsh, eh? <laughs> and I, I was angry for about I don't know thirty seconds, and then I got the giggles. I thought that like that, that like that, that is really. Funny the way that he's really attacked me, and um, but I carried on. I didn't get any better. My, my problem as a newsreader is I got easily distracted because you know you're reading the audio cue, and um, so all the work's been done, and it, I don't know it's five minutes work, seven minutes work, and I'd be halfway through the audio cue and my mind would start going, <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah. And I remember one time because I would on the weekends I would be the sports sub, so I'd decide what went in the news. And read it, and and put it together. And there was a story. There's a brief period where the I think it was the Sunday News turned into this really weird tabloid <laughs> newspaper, and they did a story about um, someone had spotted aliens on the Rotorua golf course. So <laughs> I had a um, Godzilla on my desk. So I, I got sent someone down, a cameraman, and I said, just go and put this Godzilla in various parts around the golf course and just film it. And then you know, talk to the people about um, about the aliens. What and sort of size are we talking? Oh, I don't know. It would be yeah, I don't know, a forty centimeters, like a like a plush toy. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it, they put it in the tree and stuff. So they'd interview someone, and they'd put it in the tree behind them. Like, no, I've never seen any aliens down here. It was sort of like a running gag, um, which <laughs> you didn't do in the news back then. <laughs> it's very what you're yeah. explaining is very crowd goes wild. I know, but I I um, so when it came back. We paid the item, and when it came back to Tom Bradley and I, I'd put this Godzilla thing between us on the, on the desk, and said to him something <laughs> like, something like, uh, you know, imagine people thinking they're seeing aliens; they must be going nuts. And then, you know, now let's have a look at the weather. And I got called into the boss's office. Oh my God, did I get it? <laughs> like, who do you think you are? This is not a comedy show, you know. Blah blah blah. I was like, oh man, I just got ripped apart. So. Um, 
at the end of that year, it must have been 89, I, I was away on tour um, um, covering the All Blacks and there was a story in the paper that I'd been dumped and replaced by, uh, they, they, they got rid of me and Richard Beck actually and replaced us with, um, with Jeremy Coney and uh, Phil Gifford. So, um, oh, and it was true, it was true. You had been, yeah, you, been, you found out you were dumped by reading it in the yeah, paper, yeah. That's outrageous. Oh, it's pretty bad. Actually, there's a lot of out, there's a lot of outrageous stuff in that story, like that review as well. Like, oh, yeah, I was pretty bad though, to be fair. I don't know, I found a clip uh, on YouTube of yeah. you and your, your, your early days. I don't, it was fine, wasn't it? <laughs> no, it <was>, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I would just go off on tangents and, um, like it was sort of almost like the prototype for Sports Cafe, mm. but you know, that's not. The six o'clock news. I, I got into trouble a lot for um, for not taking it seriously. Do Do you think you might have ADHD and it was just never diagnosed when, or never even a thing when you were a no, kid? No, I don't. I don't have ADHD. It's not so much. It's more that um, I, there's some strange stuff going on in this head. And um, once I start, <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. I was like, oh my god, that's when when trouble. It happens. sounds like ADHD. When, yeah. yeah. Um, that fact. That's a great story about the Godzilla on the desk. Yeah. Like that's um. There's a, a lot of people that would will be listening to this or I watching this. I need to this. get that. I need to. Um, that, would it be a bit? Would it be a, an existence somewhere? Must do. They they must have kept um, the bulletins. Um, it's it's fucking groundbreaking because yeah, back then, as you, as you said, like people, you didn't fuck with the news. No. It was half an hour a night and it was very serious. Like there was no internet then. So this yeah. was that and the next morning's newspaper was the only Because that was of... just before TV3 came on. So I think TV3 came on in the end of 89 from memory, mm. something like that. Um, and <laughs> I got into trouble then too because I... Um, um, I'm seeing a pattern. The, um, Matthew Ridge, 1990. So Matthew Ridge changed codes, went to rugby league. And he, I knew he was doing it because I was going to do a doco on him. And um, and at that stage, TV3 didn't have any rugby rights and they weren't actually allowed into Eden Park. So, um, you know, no one quite knew how the rights thing worked back then. And so they came in to do the press conference that Matthew was holding. And um, I remember saying, to, <laughs> remember saying to Matthew, don't say anything to them, you know, as, they, as you go past, because I knew they weren't going to be allowed in. And... Um, they couldn't get into the press conference. Someone from Auckland Rugby shut the door on them, and so they the cameraman kicked the door, <laughs> and that was front page of the Herald. You know, um, <laughs> network battle. You know, it was sort of like, oh, so um, I was in trouble again. And th then you ended up being um, the All Blacks' uh, first ever media liaison yep. officer. Um, we, uh, this seems like quite a common thing now. I'm not sure who's doing it now, but it was Joe Locke for like 15 yep. years or something. So there's very few people that have that have had it. So what was your so this was 1992. By the way, how did you get the job? Because Laurie Maines was the coach. He hated your guts. He didn't like me. Um, yeah, why? What did you do to him? Oh, I was from Auckland. That didn't help. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I did a story where I took an old grab of his and used it out of context. And uh, I shouldn't have done it. And, 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 and he was right to be angry with me. Um, like if you did that now, the All Blacks would blacklist you, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah. Well, he, he, he just didn't talk to me for about yeah. five years. And then... At the end of, so the 91 World Cup, um, the Aussies had a journo with them, a guy called Greg Campbell, and I thought, shit, that's a great idea. So I said to New Zealand Rugby, I, I wrote them a couple of pages on it, and I said, you should get a media liaison officer, you know, and um, because, you know, to deal with the media and stuff, and they were like, no, nah, no, nah, we're sweet. And then halfway through that tour in 92, um, uh, they were getting into a bit of media strife, and... I get a call on my phone at, oh, it must have been like one o'clock in the morning, I was in a bar, and they were like, can you come to the manager's room? I'm like, oh, what have I done? Like, I, <laughs> the night's not over yet. And um, so I went into the room and Neil Gray was the manager and, and, and George Berry was the um, CEO and they're like, we've decided that we need to take you up on that offer of media liaison officer, you start tomorrow. Um, wow. And I said, so what do I do? And they said, well, you've got to work that out. Because we'd never had one, didn't exist. And so the next morning, I remember I got on the, I said to Fitzy, who was the captain, I said, what do I do? Like, they, they were off to practice. Do I just meet you at practice or what do I do? He said, on the bus. And I said, I can't go on the bus, you know. And he's like, I'm the captain, get on the bus, sit next to me. So I got on the bus, sat next to him. And as I walked past Laurie, Laurie said, what's that prick doing on the bus? <laughs> no one had told Laurie. 
<laughs> oh, he had no involvement in it at all. Them. Oh my god! No, so Shit. Um, so he wasn't happy. Um, but yeah, I mean, we had some. Laura and I had some interesting conversations for a while, but uh, you know, eventually, I got some really good advice from uh, J.K. and Fitzy. They said, you know, in the all black environment, you're going to get challenged all the time, and, and Laurie's going to challenge you, you know, because uh, what you've got to do is just keep doing a great job day after day, and he'll learn to respect you. He doesn't have to like you, but he'll learn to respect you and then accept you. And that was that was sort of my mantra: is just keep have a thick skin and uh, and just keep um, turning up each each day. And, you know, it was an amazing time. Um, you know, I did it from 92 to the end of the 95 World Cup, um, which we lost. Um, and, you know, got to see some amazing stuff. I, 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 it was a, a real privilege and an honour to do that job. And you did some, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the Jonah stuff in a second because you were, you were media liaison when um, yep. Jonah, the Jonah fever sort of hit. There's actually a great, great old photo on your Instagram page of um, him like walking off the field and you just sort of over his shoulder yeah. and he's swarmed by people. Um, but yeah, when, in a, when you said, you'd, you'd, when we locked on this podcast, I um, bumped into Dame Julie Christie and I said, oh, oh yeah. Rick's coming over. <laughs> You know, anything I should say, and she said, she said, oh, I can't really offer you anything to say, but um, the stuff that he did with like the good, the bad, and the rugby was just groundbreaking. And it sort of, yeah. even though it doesn't have a direct link, it sort of set the way for what we see now with like Drive to Survive and other sport. And she she was saying that the um, she reckons the All Blacks have gone back, like receded a long way in terms of openness and stuff. But that was um, yeah, that was incredible. You look back now, you must be immensely proud of that. Well, first of all, that's really nice, Julie. I mean, we both sort of started out at the same time and. Um, you know, I mean, the amount of times we crossed paths was incredible. Um, and uh, yeah, I really appreciate that, Julie. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was sort of most of the things that I've done come from JK telling me that, you know, there's a problem, we need to fix it. And um, I'd given him some off cuts of the 88 to it uh, for his own private stuff. And um, he's like, oh, we should do a, a video, you know. And at that stage, there wasn't a a VHS market like that. There was there was Alison Holt's cooking show and <laughs> Jeff Thomas's Snapper Secrets were the only two that were for sale. And um, so yeah, so we I didn't really know what I was doing. I just thought I was I was there as a news reporter, and I was just like, well, if I just film a bit extra, and then when I come back, I'll cut it together into a into a, a documentary and put it on a VHS. Um, the players were amazing. They just really embraced it. And I'd come down in the morning, and I'd go, "Where's the crew?" And I said, "Oh, the boys have gone out to play golf, taking the crew with them." Or, you know, the boys have gone here; they're taking the crew. So, so they really bought into it. And um, well, it's, it's very unpretentious, say eh, the, the footage. Yeah, and I think a lot of the um, motivation was, you know, for someone that had come into the environment from the outside, like myself. To realise that they were just normal people, it's like a club team, you know, just the same mm. personalities and stuff like that. They were just really good at rugby, and uh, and yeah, it was a. I came back at the end of the tour, and, and I just cut it in my spare time uh, with an editor over the Christmas break, and then we put it out. And I remember at that stage, the biggest selling book was um, Colin Meads's um, biography, which had done fifty five thousand copies. And we were well over a hundred thousand, you know. So um, for the video tape, yeah, the video went mm -hmm. nuts, and and people had to buy it out of garages and wick calls and all that sort of stuff because there, there were no there was no shop selling videos, you know. Um, but now, you know, uh, I, I'm actually I don't even have a copy of the Good, the Bad, and the Rugby on VHS. Mm. It's on, it's on YouTube now. Yeah, well, yeah, I watched some yeah, of the footage yeah, the yeah, other yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. It's it's great. It's really really. Um, yeah, it sort of breaks down that wall between the All Blacks and the fans. They were, I feel um, like that wall's back up now. They were great people. Like, I was yeah. really lucky. I, I mean, I spent a lot of time, you know, and the guys like Fitzy and, um, you know, Buck and Brano and Foxy and those sort of guys, you know, just just really good people, really had a good balance because, you know, they were working at the same time. And then, the, you know, I mean, back then they were trained Tuesday, Thursday, you know, only allowed, like, three days I think before a test match to assemble and stuff like that mm. so they were, yeah they were just good people and I, I really yeah. enjoyed my time yeah it's crazy to think because um, I've had JK on the podcast and we talked about how uh, during the 87 World Cup he was like bulleted out at people's houses yeah, yeah. and stuff so yeah I mean obviously not 87 to 92 is quite a, quite a big difference but it but was we still had that, very just talking about JK we had so he got injured early in that tour in 89 and um, 
<laughs> he's, he's got such a great brain. As he's getting carried off, he blew his Achilles. As he's getting carried off, he's yelling at the crew, follow the ambulance. Get some shots of me going into the surgery. <laughs> so the crew took off, jumped in the car, drove behind the ambulance, and they get these shots of JK getting wheeled into surgery and stuff like that. You know, um, so yeah, I mean that was a real team effort. That was me and him. All those, all those videos. You know, um, and uh, I had no idea what I was doing, so I cut it. It was like two hours long or something, two and a half hours long. Um, because I just wanted to put everything in. I had no idea about structure and pace and all those sort of TV terms. I just chucked everything in. It was like a giant home movie. Mm. I've, I've heard you say that a lot about about almost every venture you've done. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Sports Cafe, I had no idea what I was doing. But it, It's it, true. It must just be like um, like an instinct you have, though. No, it's true. I, I think I like, I like putting stuff in order. Like in in an order, and that's essentially what you do in television: is you get a whole lot of stuff, and you put it in the right order, and the right pace. Pace and structure for me is everything. And I worked out pretty soon that I was, you know, quite good at that. And um, and so, you know, I, that's what I really enjoyed. But but yeah, you, it's not a self-deprecating sort mm. of comment. I literally knew nothing about making documentaries mm. when I made The Good Man of Rugby. I worked it out as I went along. I literally knew nothing about doing chat shows and live shows when I did Sports Cafe until I started doing it. And I think that's that New Zealandness. And you, you, we're so naive sometimes we don't understand the challenge. It's like, oh, yeah, I'll give that a go. I'll be able to do that. <laughs> yeah. But it's sweet, you know. Yeah, like, how I, hard can it be? I've just come back from running a rugby club in New York. I've never done that before, you know. So, um, but. It, it's important, I reckon, to not be like have a little bit of fear because that that get the adrenaline flowing, but not let that um, that fear stop you trying. Mm. Um, I say to people, you know, like the first episode of Sports Cafe, it was so bad, and I walked off the set, and the crew wouldn't look at me, like so I'd look at the camera when they go. <laughs> No one would look at me except we had this one producer working with us, Alan Thurston, who was a genius, Thirsty, and as crazy as I was. And he looked at me and he gave me the thumbs up and he said it was shit, but there's something there. And I was like, yeah, you're right, there's something there. You know, we, let's 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 build on that. Um, so you, you've got to start. I mean, that's the the, the easiest piece of advice. You just got to start. It is, and fail and learn from your yeah. fail, failures is, is where the growth happens, right? Yeah, or well, just you know just. I always think that when you make a TV series, um, that you know that the first episode is going to be a bit crap um, because you put all this thought into it and then you put it out there and you overthink it and then you, it's not till you see the first one you go, ah, mm. I just change that and change that and change that and then the second one's better and then the third one's normally humming. Mm. That's, that's what I've found. Yeah, we'll dig deep on that soon, the, the TV stuff, because, um, yep. yeah, uh, you've had two TV shows that lasted for a decade or more, which um, yeah. is, is incredible by yeah. New Zealand standards, yeah. right? Yeah. It's remarkable. But, um, yeah, just back to the Jonah stuff. So yep. so Jonah comes on the team, he's how old, like 18, 19? Yeah, so he's, he's a kid, eh? really young, and the, he played two tests against France, and, um, and then they decided to drop him, is not really the right word, they, they sort of said, look, I think you need... A bit more time, so um, um, they replaced them. Uh, whatever the next test were, I think we played South Africa, and then um, the '95 World Cup. He was close to the squad, but didn't make the initial squad. Um, and I remember Eric Rush. The, the the team was due to play a warm up game in Hamilton. And Eric Rush got injured, and so they called Jonah up from the I don't know why the training group or the New Zealand 15. And he came up and he just <laughs> destroyed everyone at mm. training. I remember he hit the bag and Richard Lowe went back 20 metres <laughs> back. And then he hit the next bag and Jamie Joseph went another 20 metres back. I was like, oh man, I think we need to pick him. And um, But like when we got to the World Cup, because he hadn't set the world on fire in 94, I went down the night before the first game with him to do, talk to media and no one showed up. Like not a single person, and him and I were just standing in the floor of the hotel, really awkwardly going, "I don't think anyone wants to talk to you, Jonah. You can go back to your room." Was there no sort of heat around him at that time? No, because no. he wasn't a star right. at that stage. You know, he was a guy who'd played two tests, um, and then um, missed 
the, the, the test against South Africa. And, you know, um, even the game before, the World Cup warm-up test was against Canada and he came off the bench. So the next night, the guys opened the World Cup against Ireland and he just destroyed Ireland. Mm. Like, I, unbelievable. And from then on, it was like, um, I don't know, a rugby version of Taylor Swift. It was just incredible. Far out. Everywhere we went, he was just getting mobbed. And um, so my job after a test match was to run on the field and protect them um, and help them get off the field. Um, you see, you, you must have been in a good spot because you'd been media liaison for three years at that point. So yeah. you'd, you'd sort of created this job and job description for yourself. Um, yeah. But three years and you've got a fair idea what you're doing. But you still, to a degree, must have felt like a deer in the headlights. Cause I never dealt anything yeah. like that before. Um, you know, yeah, it must have been insane. And um, it was, we, we did a supermarket visit. And before we went and, and mixed with the, with the fans, we ended up and did some signing for the... Um, for the managers and stuff and then outside there was about 300 people waiting for the all blacks and so i said oh sean if you can lead them out and so sean led them out and this lady came up to sean and she said oh i've been waiting for you for so long uh but three hours i've been waiting here for you you know please you're my favorite player can you sign this rugby ball and he wrote sea and jonah walked past and she ripped the ball <laughs> off him <laughs> and jonah started running and and everyone ran with jonah I remember standing next to Sean. There was no one left. Like, like the rest of us were just standing there. Going, oh well, I was going to have a coffee then, boys. Wow, what a crazy time to be part of that. Yeah, crazy thing to experience. He was. What, what, what was he like? Was he quite quite shy? Uh, was the All Blacks was quite. A, there was a real sort of hierarchy thing at that point. Who did he hang out with? Was no, it like Rushy and Bunsy? He was, was, yeah, yeah, Frank and Eric and, and those guys. But um, he was a good guy. Had a good sense of humour. The only thing, like. For some reason, he decided he wanted to play fight me all the time. So I'd be walking oh down a corridor and he'd jump out and just give me a hook into the guts or something <laughs> like that. And then he'd disappear and I'd be doubled over. <laughs> oh, yeah, good one, Jonah. Oh, God. You know? So, yeah, I, 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 I really enjoyed uh, Jonah's company. He was um, One day he, um, he ate a bowl of boiled eggs and there must have been 20 of them in there. And, so, and then Laurie decided he didn't play that well the next game. So eggs were off we went no one else was allowed to eat the eggs so um yeah it was just i mean he was really young um i think he was calm though i, I always felt him really calm you know while all this crazy was going on he had phil kingsley jones who was managing mm. it all so he could just let phil do that anything in the team he could let me do this and I, one of the things i always felt with jonah is um he loved being part of the family you know he loved being an all black and he loved you know his friendship with Rushy and 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 Frank and those boys and and the team and he he really blossomed as the stronger a sense of belonging to the team the better he played and um, you know no more so than when he destroyed England um, mm -hmm. and I think that was really important to him I think to 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 feel part of the All Black family was a big part of it for him yeah I mean yeah a, a, a tragic end. Um, to, to his to his life and uh you, you look back at some of the stuff he went through like having to go on the home show to apologize when he got married and didn't tell his family you look back yeah. now it's, it's like personal personal yeah. shit it shouldn't have been yeah. a, uh, it's, it's alarming you look you look back and um but thanks for sharing those stories i love nothing more than a jonah story yeah oh, he's a good man i think at the end of the day you know when you, you what was jonah like jonah was a good man mm, that's cool um, so then the TV stuff. So Sports Cafe, how, how did they... There'll be a lot of people listening to this that are, like me, massive, massive fans of it and have nothing but fond memories of it. And there'll be a lot of people that won't even remember. But this, yeah. this was groundbreaking stuff. And you say you don't know what you were doing, but I, I was in um, commercial radio at the time and we had consultants all the time. So w what you were essentially doing was like... Um, whether you knew it or not, was like a breakfast radio show on TV. Oh, big time, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, it was, yeah. You had, you had so, like the, the goofball. Yeah. You had the, the straight man. Yeah. You had the so that was my background, you know, so Breakfast Radio. And um, so that very much um, was on my mind. Uh, we created it because, um, again, you know, JK and I having a couple of beers and we're talking about how um, we never really got to see the players express themselves on TV shows, you know, because um, and we wanted to create that sort of touring sort of, type environment we you know it was really loose and stuff like that and initially it was going to be jk me and and zinni um and 
then JK couldn't make the pilot show. I brought in a um, Tanya from Radio B, and the only person I knew in the Warriors, because I got JK because he was a warrior at that stage, the only person I knew in the Warriors other than JK that was available was Macca. So I rang Macca up and I said, do you mind um, filling in for the pilot? And I remember he walked into the makeup room wearing normal clothes and came out with a suit from the 1970s. <laughs> Don't know where he found it. And he changed, at that moment, he changed what was going to be a serious, relaxed show into what it turned into be. And um, and then J.K. rang me up and said, mate, I'm really busy. I don't think I'd do the first few shows. And I said, oh, don't worry about it, mate. We're, we're sweet. We'll, we'll use Macca. And... Um, he was a phenomenal talent, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. incredible. I, I, I was at that age, I suppose in my early early 20s, my 20s at the time, me and all my mates started sort of talking like him. Oh, yeah. Same I sort still of see it today. Do I you? still see people, a lot of people, um, um, you know, even sometimes when I listen to the, some of the ACC guys, I mm. think, oh, they sound like Macca, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, massively influential. And, um, you know, like a, just a genius around timing and all that sort of stuff. He... he, he Sometimes he put zero thought into it. Sometimes he put, you know, 3% thought into it. But um, he just, he used to sit behind me on the All Black bus and um, he used to just crack me up all the time, just, you know, just abusing everyone and taking the piss out of everyone. So I knew he was funny. I didn't realise it was that funny. And then he just became really annoying. <laughs> yeah, so your, your role on Sports Cafe was sort of like the, the anchor or straight man, whatever you, yeah. the, the links man, whatever you want to call it. Um, and you always looked fucked off with him. Were you or was that an Oh, act? there was sometimes I was, yeah. I mean, he he thought that the show was funny because I put so much effort into it and he <laughs> ruined it. He, he thought that was the concept of the show. Like, like, oh yeah, you're going to make a show and I'm going to ruin it. That's a brilliant concept. I was like, no, that, that's, that's not what I'm looking for. But um, the, the, the one time I got really angry was when he was drunk and I'd put a lot of work into the show and, you know, had some good guests and stuff like that. And I rang him at one o'clock. I knew he was at lunch. And I was like, mate, you sound like you've had a few. Are you going to get home soon? Yeah, yeah, I'm on my way home. And I kept ringing him, kept ringing him. He was still there. Six o'clock, still at lunch, you know, and we used to start, let's say, 8.30. Um, 7.30, still at lunch. I said, mate, I need you to come. I need you to leave now. So we started the show. Pretty sure we started. He wasn't even there. But we, we might have, he might have been there two minutes before we went live on air. He walked in and he was so drunk. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, what are, you, what are we going to do here? And he had this because he was always trying to sell his New Day t-shirt. So he grabbed a New Day t-shirt, put it over his big jacket. He was looked like the Michelin man. And um, and then I, the way my brain works is like, he's really drunk. I'm just going to keep throwing questions at him. I'm just going to catch him out. I'm just going to make his life a nightmare. <laughs> and then at the commercial break, I said, get him out of here. I'm going to kill him. Get him out of here. He'd kick the ball into someone's face in the audience. He just had a nightmare. So they took him over to get some coffee into him. And we put a, um, we had a fiberglass cow in the set. And we put it in Mark's spot. And just as we came back from commercial break, I looked over and there's Macca arguing with the cow. I was like, what are you doing in my spot, mate? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so after the show, everyone knew to get out of my way. So I'm like, Upstairs, mate. So Macca went upstairs. I ripped into him. I was like, that is so unprofessional. You've made me look like an idiot. You know, who do you think you are? Blah, blah, blah. Ripped him in. The, the reality is, is that now that show's gone down in history. Is for many people, it's the funniest show we did. So, you know, once again, he wins. You know? <laughs> but on, on reflection, um, yeah, what, what makes you wince? I, I had Lee Hart sitting in that chair. He... <laughs> he, he he still talks years on about regretting about you know, killing a snail live on TV, which seems like oh, a small yeah, so thing, funny. but he just thinks it's pointless and it's something he wouldn't do now. What yeah. about you? Is there anything that you look back on and go, ooh? Um, oh, yeah, posing for photos for Nude Day was probably not my finest <laughs> hour. Um, no, Nude Day was like a, a, a cultural phenomenon, though, wasn't it? What I, I loved about it, you know, these, these influences nowadays, I, I think back then we could get most of New Zealand to go naked for a day. Macca would t say, you know, you have permission from the police, which they didn't. <laughs> and um, and people would send us in videos of themselves nude doing stupid stuff. Like, that's influence. Yeah, well, there, there were even cops involved, weren't there? Some yeah, no, some, like, co cops the, posing nude on the cop car. and No, the gore no. 
policeman um, did a whole thing um, and he got the sack. <laughs> wow. And it was front page of news. And then um, about a couple of weeks later, the local fire brigade also did the nude day stuff. So, yeah, people really got into it. It was mm. funny. It was so funny. Oh, it was just an incredibly well done show. And but then, now we get all these lawyers and doctors coming up to me at functions going, you know, in, uh, what, in 1998, the nude day tapes, do you still have those? Because um, I sent an entry and I'd prefer if no one ever saw it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, the hard thing now is to be finding like a, a player to yeah. play the tapes on, yeah. even if they were still in existence. And the, um, yeah, it was amazing. And then your final show, you even had like a, a video message from Helen Clark, oh, yeah. uh, who was the Prime Minister at the time. You think now, um, whoever the Prime Minister is, even if it's a fun Prime Minister like a John Key or a Chris Luxon, they'd have people saying, no, think of the optics. Yeah, she was, she was, I mean, she had a good sense of humour. I mean, the thing is, the reason I think Sports Cafe worked because, um, and you know, you've got to take the guys that um, John Follett and um, Nate Smith, who were the sort of people that run Sky, that, that they said, so they didn't give us any money. They just said, here's an hour of TV. Um, you've got to maze, raise the money through sponsorship and advertising. Um, but we're going to let you go. Just just don't get our license taken off, you know. Mm. And um, and they were really supportive, um, even in the early, early days. Um, so they gave me the confidence to try things because I knew I wasn't going to get taken off here. I mean, the first year we did 40 shows, the first wow. year. And the reason we did 40 is I worked out that if I got paid X amount of dollars per show, I'd have to do 40 shows to mm. get enough. Um, <laughs> um, so, but we, yeah, and, 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 and like, that's not always the case in television. You, mm. you know, you don't normally get that freedom. And, um, and so, yeah, I'm really thankful for those guys. Mm. And was it live live? Yeah. It was live for probably 90% of the time. We, t we did this, <laughs> our 10th, year anniversary by that stage we were on tvnz and um because our sponsors wanted a bigger audience and we did our 10-year anniversary show and for some reason there was a problem with the link and i i said welcome to the show and then it cut out and no one saw the rest of the show we didn't realize we did the show and no one saw it they had to run a standby show so then tvnz ripped ripped me apart and they're like this is disgraceful you need to can't do that again you need to record it an hour early um so we can make sure it's in house before we play it mm. and and so that was what we did the last year but um the irony of that is we had <laughs> so our show was i think 46 minutes and then the, re the rest of the hour was made up of commercial breaks but we had this new person working for us and she timed it at 46 minutes then took commercial breaks off so we did this recorded show, which they wanted us to do. And I was like, shit, that was over quick. And um, then we were inside having a beer, and then um, I get this call from TVNZ going, hey, guys, you were like, I don't know, 13 minutes short. I'm like, well, we can't. There's nothing we can do about it. Like, like I don't know. I'm on the floor. I don't know how long. I'm just waiting for the director and the uh, director's assistant to give me cues. So, yeah, so that didn't work that well. Oh, my God. But, um, like, I'm thinking uh, there was another sort of master of New Zealand TV at the time, in my opinion, Mikey Havoc. Um, and he did, oh, yeah. he did a live show once, which was just diabolical yeah. and disastrous. So there's... Um, he came... Yeah, him, him and Newsboys started, I think, this, the year after us. And it was a good time. I mean, mm. We'd watch their stuff. And, um, you know, Graham Hill had come from BFM, so he knew them pretty well. And um, there was a bit of crossover. And then Graham went and worked on um, uh, Jeremy's... Um, I can't remember what oh, the show like was eating called. media lunch. Or yeah, something. eating media lunch. Yeah. yeah, Graham was one of the guys on that. One of the geniuses behind that. So it was it was nice. It was a nice little crew of yeah. people. Lots of you know Paul Castle and stuff. They were mm. really smart guys. You know, so there's a lot of sort of um, uh, you're sharing each other's success. Yeah, Gee, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm just thinking as you're you're speaking. So there was the core cast of um, Sports Cafe, but then. This just that peripheral cast, which was phenomenal. You know, the human cannibal, yeah. Eva from Bulgaria. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that guy who we mentioned Lee Hart, before, yeah. Lee Hart. Uh, it's incredible. You're, um, yeah, you're quite the talent spotter. Right? I'm interested to see how you deflect this one because you've made so many careers. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's sort of giving people a chance, like, and then giving them time to find their voice. I think that's been the key. Um, you know, I love watching the news at night and seeing Haley Holt on the news. You know. Mm. Um, you know, those sorts of things. Um, 
I really enjoy. That's probably what gives me the greatest buzz is seeing people um, that come through, you know, the Mark Richardson sort of stuff. Um, Lee Hart, you know, I mean, Lee's oh, still on bias, but I reckon he's the funniest guy in New Zealand. Mm. And, um, you know, we just gave him an outlet and then he just took off and, mm. you know, the rest is on him. And um, we got him in, we got him in because Macker and I were talking about this character and we, we wanted to do something funny and he, he knew Lee, you know, he said, oh, I've, I've been talking to Lee about it and Lee's got a whole bio about this guy, you know, he's, he's, he's really prepared this and it's very funny. So um, so he came in and Lee had done a brilliant job in, in, in really putting a backstory behind the character, which is not something we ever did before. And then about um, a week later, two weeks later, um, uh, Norm Hewitt had, had done it had to do a very tearful apology on TV. That's right. He, he got drunk and ended up um, smashing a ranch something slider to the wrong hotel room or something. Yeah, I can't remember. But yeah, it was awful. But then we, then Lee Hart mm. did a parody of it and he did an apology because he said, look, you know, I'm not really a snail racer. I don't really know how fast these things can go, you know. And so um, I knew. So the next year I was like, because Lee was working for a Greenstone at that stage, production company as a researcher. And I was like, mate, you need to come full time and be with us. So um, the first three or four weeks, he made up a different name every time. I remember he was doing a, a um, piece of camera at the viaduct and he goes, and he signed off, Rick, Rick, and he turned around, the boat was called Crescendo, Rick, Rick Crescendo, <laughs> you know. Was, so then I said, mate, we just need a generic name. Let's, let's just call you that guy and let's just let's just go from there. And um, yeah, I mean, he is so clever, mm -hmm. you know. But so is, you know, the Cannonball and Eva the Bulgarian. I mean, they were really smart people. They knew their characters, and um, they knew, um, you know, it's really playing. You, you you take some of your own qualities and you you exaggerate them into a character, and that's why it's always funny for me whenever I go into meetings you know, serious business meetings. People see me as the guy that presented Sports Cafe, not the guy that made it. So they think I'm an idiot, you know. So <laughs> I'm trying to get something really important across and they go, oh, yeah, where's Eva the Bulgarian, you know. So, um, you know, and we haven't talked about Lana. I mean, it, without Lana... Yeah, yeah. Lana's um, dry humour. Um, I heard her at a function before she worked for us and I was like, oh, man, she... Everyone thinks that she's like this and she's like that, and that's funny. And so when we had the opportunity to put her in there, um, she was only supposed to do a couple of weeks, and she did like you know, twelve years. Um, yeah, she was sort of the glue that kept us mm. together. Oh, she played that role particularly well too. Like sometimes she'd yeah. side with you, sometimes she'd yeah. side with Mark. Because I think what would happen with me is I'd get angry with Mark, and then he'd suck me in, and I'd get caught up in his stupid ideas mm. you know no we're not going to do that no 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 well actually if we do you know and then, <laughs> and then Lana would slap me across the face no Rick don't don't be fooled by him you know so yeah and none of that was um, like contrived not, not in the early, early days and as we got through sort of started to understand the dynamics and, and, and work out how to play with them very much like Breakfast Radio mm. You know, it's like, well, I know my character, you know your character, so let's let's do stay this. in your lane. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was very much like a breakfast radio yeah. show. And then, and then, crowd goes wild after that. Well, yeah. I'm I'm brushing over Sugar Shack. You don't yeah. want to do <laughs> Sugar Shack was cool because, um, because I got it wrong. Right. I, I, you know, you know what? I've got a really good memory about um, like pop culture and TV. I don't remember this at all. No, Sugar no. Shack at all. But I mean, it's, the, is this the only fail you've had? Oh, no, there's a few. Uh, there's yeah, Sugar Shack, which um, had a great group of people. Uh, I don't know why I couldn't make it work. Um, but I was start, starting Crowd Goes Wild at the same time, and I was spreading myself a bit thin. Um, and uh, I also did a show. <laughs> I did a show called The Bradley Bunch, which which we did one episode of. And um, the, the idea was that news has changed. So we brought Tom Bradley back. Um, which was actually uh, Jeremy Wells' idea, and and then we put everything around him. So we had Paul Ego as a cons he was a consultant, and we had Carly Binding who was his female presenter because you couldn't do the news without a female, and we had a band. And I'd been at the comedy club like the classic like 
five days before we were due to film this pilot. And I was watching this act, and I'd never heard of them before. And um, afterwards, they're in the foyer selling CDs and stuff. And I went up to them. And I said, "Do you want to be in my TV show?" <laughs> and they're like, "What do you mean?" I said, "I'm doing a TV show on Thursday, um, and you guys are really funny, so you should be in it." And so they were in it, and they were the fly the Concords, and um, and so they were hilarious. I, I'd never seen them before. They were just starting out, and um, I remember when TVNZ after the show. Um, and it wasn't my greatest work, but um, it was just, a, you know, we're just trying some stuff. And they were like, nah, don't even talk about that show. Don't even try and resurrect it. Don't even, don't even mention it in the hallway. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I get it. But, but the band were quite funny, eh? And they're like, oh, were they? And I was like, oh, fuck, I think so. Um, I, I love a story like that. Yeah, cause they, they had, um, they were really sort of, um, uh, bruised by their experience at TV, yeah. when they 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 wanted to change the entire sort of concept of the show and make it, I don't, I don't know what they wanted to make it, but then um, the BBC saw something in them. I love I love their success. I, I just yeah, it's phenomenal. A, they're two really good people. You know, I and Reese. You know, they're all really really good people. And so, you know, sometimes in New Zealand, you know, people sort of go if they see someone else's success, they get a bit shitty because it's like, oh, you're leaving me behind. I I want to pull you down etc cetera, etc cetera. but the Concords are just a incredibly talented you can see from mm. the first first time you saw them um and and you know so i mean i love their success because it's true talent finding it's true true place and um yeah that yeah but but they didn't find it in the bradley bunch <laughs> it's amazing. is it on youtube or anything i don't know i've got a copy yeah uh, it sits along sugar shack and um because the crowd goes wild i remember seeing um uh Miles, andrew mulligan at a mate's party one christmas and i think it was at the end of year one of crowd goes wild and i was saying how much i love the show and he was saying it was about to about to end yeah or it wasn't looking likely that it was going to continue so they so sky used to have a show called sport 365 which was their first sort of attempt at a new show and um and it was it was fine. It was going okay. And and Andrew Mulligan was working as a producer on that show. And then um, I got a call one day, out, completely out of the blue. John mm. Folletti, who was running Sky, rang me and he said, "Look, I I, I need to change three six five. It's not working for me. Can I give you the resource of three six five? And can you turn it into something?" I'm like, "Yeah, I can, but um, I'm a little bit busy at the moment because I'm with Mark Ellis." And two policemen, they've just let him come home to put a suit on because we're going to court. <laughs> so he was going to court. Oh, was this for the selling some ecstasy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah right. Um, so, um, <sighs> so, so that I remember it vividly, you know. Um, so we we, we 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 got through that, and then um, and then I came into Sky, and I was like, I got a whole lot of people for auditions, and because Mel's was working for Sky, I asked them to sit in on the auditions. And we went through, I don't know, 10 people. I would already knew, I knew that I wanted to use Mark because I'd actually used Mark on an episode of Sports Cafe, Mark Richardson. Mm. But um, I wasn't planning on using Andrew. Mm. And then uh, I looked through all the editions and I was like, man, Andrew's better than all. He's the best. Mm. He's so good. And the chemistry between him and Mark will work really well. So so we put them together and, um, and then, yeah, what was that, 2006? Um, and it's still going today. I, yeah. I'm not involved with it anymore. Are you, are you still executive producer? No, 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 no. So when I went to the US, I, I sort of moved away. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, all right, Andrew's done a phenomenal job. Mm. And um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I really, in those early years, it was so much fun. Because mm. again, you're just finding your voice. And um, some, some, you know, some brilliant people have gone through. I mean, we started... <laughs> Glenn Osborne was the original reporter for Crack as well, um, and um, and you know and Mark, you know Mark's very good, just so clever, knows his character really well, mm. bounced off Andrew really well, you know. Then we, during that first year, we brought McConey in, you know, um, yeah, which is a masterstroke. Yeah, and it was so I saw McConey at a um, at a rugby function, a blues function, and he was just. Uh, leaving the Herald, you know, and I said, "What are you going to do?" He said, "I don't have anything on." I said, "Well, just come and help us out, give you a couple of shifts, you know," and um, and then he just got, you know, just realised just how talented he was. Mm. 
But you, you've sort of given um, like opportunities or TV jobs to people that would never have got it from like one or three for whatever reason, and it's proved to be like a masterstroke. There's been um, some, just re- as you mentioned Hayley Holt before, some remarkable careers. Like Yeah, it's cool, eh? I, and as I say, it's cool. I mean, it's just giving the people the opportunity. And, and then I, I think sometimes in our industry... Um, you know, a producer or someone will will hire someone because they see something in them, and then they'll try and turn them into what they think they should be. Mm. Whereas it's actually easier just to let them be themselves. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think what you're describing is what happened with Flight of the Concords, right? Yeah, Trying to well, mould them into what they thought. I of. think it happens with lots of people. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you go and someone sees you've got some talent, um, and I, this, I'm talking global. They see you've got some talent. They go right. We're going to give you this show. Here's your script. This is what I want you to say. This is how I want you to act. This is what I want you to be. Whereas my strategy is a lot easier. It's like, okay, can you come in and just be yourself and I'll just sit back and watch. Mm. Yeah, because I've, I've had Mark Richardson on the, the podcast and he he talked about, um, we talked about the sketch that he did with Stephen Fleming. Oh, yeah. And yeah. He, his that's recollection funny. is that that's when he came onto your radar. Yeah. Because you thought that, yeah, that right, sketch with right. Stephen Fleming it was, was funny. Yeah, it hilarious. Was funny. Yeah, yeah. So awkward to watch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like brilliantly awkward. But that's the thing about Mark is he understands his character really mm. well. So he knows he knows why it's funny so he can replicate it, you know, because he's like, well, this is what I do really well. I can play that role. So every time he gets that opportunity, he comes in with a one-liner. Um, he knows his character, and that's I think that's mm. his, what he does well. Yeah, fuck, we've talked about a lot of high-profile stuff. There's, there's something um, that I want to talk about. It's a book that you've done, which is probably... Oh, yeah. And not very high profile. Uh, I've got the book right here. It's called I Know This To Be True, yep. uh, which is amazing. It's basically, um, it's a beautiful coffee table book. came out 2016? I don't know. 17? Yeah, 20, it sounds something like that, yeah. And it's um, it's just beautiful photos and yeah, glossy photos and uh, sort of uh, interviews with like 60 well-known New Zealanders and not so well-known New Zealanders. Um, it's kind of like a, a podcast, yeah, long-form podcast pre-podcasting. I. So I worked on that with um, a, a mate of mine, Jeff Blackwell, who's an incredible book publisher, and he's just he's just really good at that stuff. And um, there you go, deflecting again. Yeah, and I did the <laughs> I did the interviews and stuff, and we sort of created the format as we went, which was we had the piece of art um, that had, I know this to be true, and we had to trape set around everywhere. Yeah, like, like a massive picture. canvas oh, backdrop. It's ridiculous. I just got so sick of carrying that thing. It was such a great idea. And then everyone, I'd, I'd do this interview with them about their values and about what they knew to be true in their lives and stuff. And then I'd get them to come up with a word that summed up who, you know, their values and what they thought. Um, and we'd take a photo of that word on their body and then we'd get them to sign the canvas at the back, put the word up, and they auctioned it for Play It Strange. Because you know, a lot of it was for Mike Chun's Play It Strange. But for me, um, like it was a gift because I got to speak to 60 incredible people and have a really sort of private, intimate conversation with them about their, about what was important in their lives. How long was each chat? Um, uh, probably 40 minutes to an hour mm. each one. Um, you know, I, I was lucky to grab um, Colin Meads just, just before he passed away, actually, and he, mm. he was a very good friend of mine, and it was a really special time. And, um, yeah, I mean, they were all, you know, all of the... Everyone left a mark on me, mm. and... I learned a lot from doing them. I did JK and Macca. Um, uh, I think they both made me cry, actually. I know Macca did. And then... Um, did they? Can you, yeah. you can't remember what? Um, I think Macca, we were just talking about love. Mm. And, um, yeah, I mean, it was such a great gift. And then one of the people I spoke to was a lady, Elizabeth Ransom, who had sold her business to Google for... I think two hundred fifty million dollars. You know, she, wow. She done incredibly well, and she was an amazing, amazing story. Oh, I just really loved talking to her, and I interviewed her in, over in Palo Alto and in California. And at the end of it, she sort of challenged me a little bit. She, well, what are you going to do next? You know, you're doing this book. When this is finished, what are you going to do next? And I'm like, oh. She's like, because the media world's changing. You know, television's mm. changing, um, so you can't just trot out Sports Cafe again. Oh bugger! <laughs> um, and so I came back from when that book got published, and I started to really think about what next. And um, as a result of that, I started building. I built an app, a, a platform really, around fan engagement, around how to 
because again, JK and I talked about there was a real problem getting, um, you know, 20 year olds to watch live sport. And, you know, that was so important to us, live sport. And so we sort of built this thing and it was, it was testing really well. And so I thought, well, let's just go to America. I'll just move to America. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it was all because of that conversation I had doing the book. And I ended up in Austin, Texas, and um, spent a, a year sort of trying to get things off the ground, and then COVID hit. So um, that sort of put an end to that. Mm. Oh well, still in the still in the scrapbook of ideas. Yeah, yeah, no, mate, it's very much so. Yeah, now you mentioned Colin Colin Meads in, in that book, The Sun Out to Be True. The, the, I've actually got that highlighted here. This is one of my favourite parts in the book, and I think when I when I read the book when it first came out, I thought it was c- kind of savage and badass, and in the time that's passed. I've gone through my own mental health stuff and I actually find this paragraph kind of sad now in a way. So he was, um, I think, 80 at I the time. I know, this is about crying. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was 80 at the time. It was like a yeah. year or two before he died. I can't no, remember. it was like months before he died. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah. He still talked in the, the article about enjoying going out for a few beers. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, yeah, the paragraph is, um, I can't remember when I last cried. Probably when I got a hiding at home as a kid or when I was seven and had rheumatic fever and got told I had to stay in bed for eight weeks. I might have cried then. Yeah. Um, at the time I thought, fuck, this is cool. This is so Colin Meads, pine tree meads. And then I look back now and it's like um, like vulnerability and being able to cry and stuff is like a really, uh, you know, it, it was probably perceived as a weakness then. It definitely was when I was growing up. But you look back now and it's like a, a key part of living a full human existence. Yeah. It's kind of sad. Yeah, he was... I love Colin. He was such Mm. an amazing man. So when I worked for the All Blacks, he was the manager. Um, So we had a a pretty close bond. And um, I mean, (laughs) I I think I I, I couldn't believe it when he told me that. Bullshit. (laughs) Three quarters of a century without crying. It's insane. You're like, no, and it wasn't. It wasn't a um, when he said it. It wasn't a contrived comment for effect. He generally thought, because I, I, I asked that question of a few people, and he generally thought about it. And he went, oh, Jesus, oh, oh shit, I don't know. Um, well, probably when I was, you know, five or six. I was, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, <laughs> dude. It's crazy. But it just, we don't know. It was a different time, you know. And yeah. He, you know, he, he, had a, he had a tough man. He worked hard, you know. He, mm. he, he would tell me about, um, you know, how his... his Father bought some land up the road, and he, had, him, and Stan had to cut cut all the shrub, you know, to do after school. And he said to me that um, he loved going to rugby because it gave him a break from cutting shrub in the farm. You know, gave him a break from you know rugby mm. was relaxing compared to the, all the work they yeah. had to do on the farm. Um, yeah, just an amazing human being. Mm. And how, do you cry much? Are you much of a crier? Have, have you found you cry oh, more and more often as you get older? I'm half Italian, so you know there's plenty of emotion there. Um, yeah, I do. I, I, I um, you know, when I, I, I find sometimes I, I tear up a bit when I'm really grateful for things. You know, if I'm looking at an old clip or something, and yeah. I'm like, oh, I was so lucky to have that opportunity to make that or work with those people or. You know, and that, that will bring a tear to the eye. And the other thing that, um, apart from stubbing my toe, the other thing that... Um, when you were seven. Yeah, the, 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 if, if I see something where someone's got incredible talent, oh, it's just, oh, fuck, yeah, it's just, you know, that just blows me away. It's, I reckon that's the thing, one, one of the things I love most is seeing people with talent. I just love just sitting back and going, oh my God, that person has just got something special. I'm not, and I'm not, not, not talking about rugby players and stuff like that. I'm talking about just, you know, seeing someone do a song or 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 put a show there. Like, I love the West Wing and Aaron Sorkin and quite often at the end of that I'll be in tears. And I'll, I'll be in tears not because the show was was something that, that got to me. It's just because I, I'd be in tears going, oh, that was just an incredible piece of work. I can't believe someone managed to make that piece of mm. art for me, you know? And um, and th- those are the times where I just, yeah, I'll, I'll just, a tear will come to the eye and, and I was just going, oh my God, that's just incredible, you know? Wow. Yeah. It's funny, yeah, when I had Matthew Ridge on the podcast, he, he said a, a similar sort of thing, actually. He said he loves a good cry now and he said he can be just driving along in his car thinking about 
you know, people or things that he's grateful for and just to have tears. He's a great, dinner. great human being, Reggie. Yeah, he's wonderful. Uh, wonderful I chat. I think it feels like got better with age, you know. He's so I did, um, so JK and I did a documentary with him when he changed coats. So we followed him from the moment he landed in Australia to um, to his career at Manly. Uh, that's on YouTube as well, by yeah, the way, yeah, if anyone yeah. wants to look at it. I think actually it's still the highest rating sports doc of all time because there was only like one channel when yeah. we did it. <laughs> but, um, and I got to know him really well then. And um, oh, such a, yeah, such a really smart, um, really good man. Mm. Now how's, um, how's your mental health been over the years? Yeah, I, I think um, pretty good. I think um, I got a shock, obviously, being really close to JK, watching him go through his um, mm. uh, through his issues, and I didn't understand it. I didn't know, couldn't help. I just didn't know, you know, when he when he tried to talk to me about it, I just didn't understand what he was talking about. Because back then it was just not spoken about. Um, so I think um, I think because of our friendship, I've always been really conscious of it. Um, you know, I probably don't want to talk too much about, you know, um, losing Kathy, but that was a pretty tough time for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was really thankful to have JK in my corner, you know, to sort of help me get through some of that stuff. But, um, you know, I mean, we all go through tough times. I think what you learn is you can't judge people because you just don't know what's going on and there's what, what their story is, you know, mm. you know, um, and, uh, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm conscious of it, but it's, it's always a work on, you know, like yeah. anyone, I'm, like, you know, particularly when you're, when you're a creative person, you make something and you put it out there, you know, and you get called a red rubber tire or whatever, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's funny to laugh at it, but, but it can be hard. I remember. Yeah, it stings. I used to, um, I think it was, so Sports Cafe was always on a Wednesday night. And I became really conditioned on a Thursday to be, like it was almost physically I would sort of curl into a ball. Even when I'm walking out, I'd be really tight because I was just waiting for people to, um, you know that we'd got something wrong, or we'd done something naughty, or something like I, you know, in a supermarket or something. I'd be waiting for someone to attack me, and um, so even after the show finished, like for a couple of years afterwards, I would always be really, really tired on a Thursday, and really quiet because mm. I would just want to hide from the world on that day. Mm. And then once we got through Thursday, I was okay, you know, but. Um, I remember one day I was driving down the Wahi Beach and I stopped to get some petrol and I um, I was filling the car up and you know you can sense when someone's behind you, you know, and I could these people behind me. And I turned around and they were looking at me and laughing. And I said, um, what's, what's the problem? And they said, oh, we're just seeing if you had a hairy ass like Macca said on the show last <laughs> night. <laughs> Because Macca decided because I'm half Italian, I must be here. <laughs> so, you know, that was my life for, like, for a long oh, time. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't think, like, the fact that we can sit down and have the, a conversation like this now, um, we can't underestimate the, the cultural impact that John Kerwin's had on this country. Oh, you know, it's, like, r remarkable. It's easy to talk about mental health and resilience and um, vulnerability now, but he was doing it when no one was doing it. I can't imagine how terrifying that oh, was to come out. I remember when he, he rang me... Because he, he would send me the chapters of his book to read and give him some feedback. And he sent me the one on his depression called Black Dog. And um, he's like, I don't know if I'm going to put this in. And I read it and I was like, oh my God, why didn't you tell me that this was happening? I didn't understand. Because we were working together. We had a company together, Pastor Productions. And, um, and he's like, I, I think I need to put it in. I think I need to... But but it was there was a lot of thought about you know exposing that side of his life because at that stage no one had ever done that before and and no. it was a rugby book you know it's like you know tell me how many try you scored and what it was it like the night after the World Cup final and stuff like that's what rugby books were and he had this chapter about you know um, dealing with depression and, and where he where, where it got to and, and stuff but I know and I'm sure he's told you this that 
you know, when he goes out, I mean, I, you know, obviously we go out a fair bit, people will come up to him constantly and go, you've saved my brother's life, my, mm. my father, my husband, you know, particularly McNeil's, you know. Um, and yeah. you just wonder whether, you know, his All Black career was really designed to give him the profile to really do his good work. Yeah, the platform. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, he's 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 normalised it. Um, I do worry about, like, the likes of him and Mike King and uh, my friend Jazz Thornton as well. Like, yep. they, they, they take a lot on and then you get people coming coming to you, not with just with positive stories like that, but also wanting help or advice. Yep. Um, but the good thing with JK is he's written a beautiful book, All Blacks Don't Cry, mm. um, which is what I, you know, when people... Because people, a lot of people still come to me and say, well, I'm struggling, you know, and can you give me JK's number? And I go, cool, you need to read this book first, mm. you know. Um, um, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I agree with you that, that if you're going to be that person, you know, like JK is, then then you take a lot of stuff from other people. Mm. You know, you carry a lot of stuff from other people. But I, I've seen him up and down the country do his speeches and talk to people and stuff like that. And, oh, God, it's... It's captivating. It, it's life changing, you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm really proud of him. You know, I'm really proud. He's a good friend, and just really proud of mm. the impact he's had on New Zealand. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, you you mentioned um, Kathy before, and you said you, you don't want to talk about that in too much detail. As and I've noticed on your Instagram, there's not a lot there about about that as well. Uh, you just prefer to keep it private, or is it just too hard to talk about still? I just. Um, always been a big believer in my private life being private you yeah. know you know you you give that character that that people watch and and happy being that character and stuff like that but um you know so what when did i start in tv 86 so it's a long time and and you just can't give them everything you know um mm. you've got to keep part of your life for you um and and i've always felt that my family life is, is really mine for me and yeah. um you know, I was really, you know, when it was tough, I was, you know, I loved all the support we got from everyone and, and, and people were amazing. Um, but I've always been quite private. I, I, it's just, just the way I'm, 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 I, as I say, I play that role and do that stuff, but um, that side of stuff's ready for me. Yeah, oh, I, I respect that fully. Coming from like a breakfast radio background, it's the same sort of thing, like you're, you're looking for personal content because the more of that you give away, the more of a bond you form with the audience. Yeah. Um, but, you know, me and JJ, we did talk, talked a lot when we were married about our fertility issues and stuff. And once you've once you've given something away, you can't take it back. It's tough, eh? It's I, I remember talking to, you know, advising people when they were looking at doing, you know, magazine stories and stuff about their relationships and stuff like that. It's like, oh, think twice about it, you know, mm. because... As you said, you know, once you give it to them, that it's gone. Yeah. Are you have um have have you been in, in love since then, or have you seen anyone since then? Or I've seen lots of people. I was just walked down the road. There was like thirty people <laughs> walking past me. Yeah. Again, private life. You know. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. So oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm just. I, it's probably. I, I'm. I'm lucky. I guess I'm 51 now. And yeah. I've never lost anyone. Super. I've lost friends yeah. to cancer yeah, and yeah. suicide, unfortunately. But I've never lost. Um. Both my parents are still alive. Yeah. And I've never lost anyone that's really close to me. But I. Yeah, I'm probably projecting in that. Um, yeah, I can't imagine like, how difficult it is to start start a new relationship and the guilt you feel, or even though it's what your your former partner would want. It's, it's a tough. really good try, but I'm not going to answer the question. <laughs> no, no, not yeah. try, not trying at no, all. No, no, it's a good, it's a that. good point. But yeah, I, as I say, I mean, yeah, I just um, I just like to keep something for me. Yeah, and 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 and, and, my, and that's my private life. Yeah. You know, like you know, all my friendships. Uh, with you know a lot of them are with really high profile people and like you know I mean I don't think I've ever done an interview without talking about JK or Macca you know um, you know um, or dropping Fitzy in there or whatever and these are my friends you know so that part of my life is really public you know um, and um, but um, yeah and then and there's part I just like to keep for me mm. what about a book one day a Rick Salizzo book. Like yeah. every every um, question or topic that anyone throws at you, there's a good yarn behind it. Yeah. That's you thought, funny you thought about that? You've been offered? I, um, I uh, when I was in New York, I had Andy Ellis with me. That, mm. He's a great bloke. And he was getting so sick of my stories. <laughs> he was like, oh, man, don't give us another yarn of the All Blacks from the 89 tour or something <laughs> like that. And then uh, I had the... Um, one of our players, Jay Seymour, uh, who's a New Zealand Māori player, came to my house and 
and then Andy popped in and by the time Andy popped in I had you know I was showing him Zinzan Brook videos and Good to Bad and the Rugby and stuff like that poor old Jace was so um, yeah I, I don't know I think um, I, I mean the thing is I'm only halfway through you know mm. so um, maybe maybe at one stage but you wouldn't want to write a book now and then do something great next week so um, <laughs> oh, I, part I think two. I think um, someone asked me you know you go back to that question at the top about what next what I want to do next is I want to do something that's really really great you know I just really want to um, I don't know what it is but um, I, want to, I just want to keep getting better mm. I just want to so I, I I don't want to try and match what I've done before I just want to do something better mm. oh man I love that attitude so much um, yeah because I, I feel like a lot of people can, can think you're done or think that you're over the apex and uh, yeah. and that's it because you're in your 60s but um, only you can determine that yeah, could bring bring Sugar Shack back. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Learn, learn from the mistakes yeah, the first yeah. time around. Oh, one thing I forgot. So yeah, the um the Rugby World Cup last year. What was your involvement? You were like a, a content guy. No. So um, I, yeah. I, so I spent all that time with Rugby New York, which greatest city in the world. What a, mm. what a um, what an opportunity for me to live in New York and, and work. And um, oh, and I probably. I probably learned more about sports marketing and fan engagement and how to connect fans in in three or four years there than I did in thirty years here. I mean, they're just incredible. Yeah, I, I was I was like taking to school every day. And the thing about New York too is, if you don't bring your A game, you just get crushed. And so mm-hmm. you've just got to have your A game all the time, even crossing the road. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I I made the decision. So I did four seasons, one of whom got shut short, uh, shut down because of COVID. And I, I made the decision at the beginning of last year that that would be my last season. And then um, uh, they reached out to me to see whether I'd um, make some content around the All Blacks for the World Cup. And I, initially I wasn't that keen because I was like, oh, I've sort of been there, done that. But then I was like, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind. I hadn't made content for a long time. And so... Um, <laughs> I said to them, I said, who am I working with? And they said, well, we've, we've only got one person so far, and it's Andy Ellis. I was like, oh, my God. I just had him in, <laughs> living upstairs for three years or whatever, two years in New York. You know, It's like I've adopted him. Um, but he's brilliant, so it was good to work with him. And then I brought in um, George Bauer, who was um, injured prop you know, from the Crusaders and the All Blacks. And I didn't really know him, but I... I'd seen something on social that looked all right, and I thought I could work with him. And then, and then, and Stacey Walker, who I'd always liked on on TV, and um, and a couple of others, um, LJ from Wales and and Alma from South Africa, and we um, we did this thing called the Front Row Show. So we had to make, I think we made like twelve minutes a day for fifty five days in a row or something. Wow, that's a lot of content. Yeah, it was a real challenge, but. Um, um, once I got into it, I really enjoyed it. It was just good to reconnect. Good, good way of me reconnecting with New Zealand again, even though I was in France. Um, so it was good fun, and um, and we did some good stuff. Mm. Yeah, God, hell of a tournament too. Yeah. You must have been pleased when you were over there. Like with that, when was the Island game? Was that quarter final? You can you believe it? I went to every game by the Island game. Oh. I had COVID. <laughs> got up in the morning and I was like, of the Irish game, and I'm like, oh, I don't feel too well. I do a COVID test, and I'm like, no wonder I can't. So I was I I spent that week in my room, but um, yeah, it was it was a good tournament. It's it's good. Mm. My my favourite World Cup I reckon would be the '95 World Cup in South Africa. That was an incredible tournament, and I really liked. Um, not sure why, but I really liked the 2015 tournament in, in England in the UK that we won. I thought that was a fantastic tournament. Oh, Richie's last game. Yeah, I just mm. it was a really really well run, good crowds, um, had a really good buzz about it. And, and the 87 World Cup was just brilliant. I mean, people forget that the first game, you know, when JK scored that try against Italy, um, I think there was like 17,000 people there. It was like a midweek game and it was raining and it was shitty and they, they, they did a little um, opening ceremony with Walker Nathan running out and Chile just slipping <laughs> over in the rain and stuff like that. But um, um, it, was, it, was, it was really interesting to watch it unfold because 
No, the the Six Nations didn't want a World Cup, and they eventually got talked into it. So starting that, it was you know like starting the sports cafe. I mean, they had, no one had a clue what it was going to look like, mm. and uh, and it really built momentum during the World Cup um, because of the way the All Blacks were playing, and it, it, so there were some exciting games. Mm. So I enjoyed the '87 World Cup, but um, yeah, and and uh, I was enjoying the last one until the last sort of ten minutes. <laughs> Oh, it was good though. Any, any, same as the um, the uh, the other one we were talking about, the ninety five one. Any, any, any final where it's a close game. I think that's all you can ask for, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you can ask for ones that you win, <laughs> but they were good. No, I mean, I mean, I've always enjoyed New Zealand South Africa clashes. So, yeah. um, you know, being old and being brought up on that stuff, um, been amazing. And and mm. and, and, and it, you know, it was an, it was an ama- It was funny because I'm sitting in the stands watching the final and. Um, there's these six South Africans and, you know, not quiet people mm. when they're at a rugby no, game. No, very passionate. And and, um, and I can't help myself, so I'd just drop in a little smart-ass comment and I thought they were going to kill me. And then, <laughs> I, you know, I, I got half them on side against the other half. And then so we're talking at half time and they're like, oh, we're such and such and we play cricket and blah, 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 blah. And they're like, do you know Grant Elliott? And I'm like, yep. No oh, bullshit! You don't know Grant Elliott. And I said, I know Grant Elliott. Ring him. So they rang him <laughs> on the video chat. Do you know this guy? Hey, it's Rick. Hey, hey. <laughs> That's New Zealand. We all know oh, each other. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. So they're talking to Grant Elliott at half time because um, they play cricket with them in South Africa. Unreal. Yeah. Hey, that's been um, 90, 90 minutes of your time. Do you enjoy doing things like this? You enjoy reflecting, or you're you're too busy looking forward to what's next? No, I I, um, I enjoy it. I, I as I say, I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful because for everything I've done, someone's given me that opportunity, you know, whether it's the guys at Sky or, you know, Jeff with the book or, um, you know, someone said, you know, you can do this. Um, sometimes I've had to bash the door down a little bit but um, and, and just be a bit pushy. I mean, when we did the Matthew Ridge documentary, um, uh, at the, the people at TMZ didn't want it and... Um, so I went to John McCready, who was running TV2, and he said, look, just make it on your credit card. I'll get it sorted while you're away. And so I came back, and they had, like, 50 grand on my credit card. Mm. And um, oh my God. they could have easily gone, no, we don't want it. Um, but they said, yeah, yeah, and they cleaned my credit card. I didn't get paid a cent for it, um, but I got a clean credit card. Um, <laughs> and this was, like, late 80s, so 50 yeah, yeah. grand is... 50 grand's a house. Um, so... Um, yeah, I'm just really grateful. I'm just really grateful that, um, you know, people just believed in me enough to give me an opportunity to, to be creative. Mm. And um, you're the same. You, you, that's all you want. You just, when you're creative, you just want to be able to create. And someone's got to pay for it. And someone's got to put it on for an audience, you know. So, um, you know, my job's to create, but someone else has got to pay for it and someone else has got to on an audience mm. I mean it's a bit different now like you're doing this here so I think that's really exciting I think it's a really exciting move for people now is that they can create their own shows they're not stuck by going to have to pitch to a broadcaster but but it's more competitive than it's ever been mm. Like, so you're trying to get an audience on YouTube where the greatest collection of content of all time lives so um, so it's competitive but if you can find your niche it's just brilliant. It's what a, what a great time to you know, I mean, when we when we did Sports Cafe, I had to buy a studio. You know, when we did it at the bar, and it cost me eight hundred nine hundred grand to buy a studio. Oh. You know, and I just backed myself that we would stay on here long enough to pay it off. <laughs> so it took about five years, six years to pay it off. Um, oh my god! But um, <laughs> but now you know. You know, for a fraction of that, you know, you, you're able to put a show together. Mm. You know, and how exciting is that? Yeah, it's great. I, yeah, I mean, no one knows where the where the future of media is going to go, but uh, I just feel like it's going to be in micro audiences. So instead of having yeah. like a TV one, TV two, yeah. TV three with big fat audiences, it's just going to be far more fragmented. Yeah, yeah, and uh, like having been there when it was easy, you know, where if you put something on TV one and everyone watched it, um, to to you know making content for the All Blacks mm. where. It's competitive, um, but you just need enough. Mm. I, I always think that um, when you make something, if 
three or four people tell you they love it, then then you're onto something. <laughs> yeah, you can build from that. Yeah, that's all you need. Just that sniff of success. Yeah, just three or four people, and not your family. All right, Rick Salizzo. It's been. Um, I, I I feel like I know you particularly well from years and years of, of um, you know TV. Um, but I do think this is the first time we've met. But I've um, thoroughly loved sitting down and picking your brains. It's been a real honour, and I, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity. Oh, it's been fun, mate. I really enjoyed it. Nothing better than talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I lo- love your work, love the modesty, and I genuinely can't wait to see what you do next. Yeah, me too. Yeah, good luck with the knee replacement. All right, thanks, mate.